So Psalms 84 will be our passage of scripture that will help, uh, in my mind, to frame what I believe 17 years of ministry means for us, what it invites us to think about, and certainly, uh, hopefully, a way forward. Uh, Psalms 84 is uh, one of these uh, psalms that was written not by David, amen, because many folks think that David wrote all the psalms, but the book of Psalms was a praise book. It was a book of prayers. It was a book of what we would call worship songs. It was their liturgical book. It was a book that they constantly read during the times of temple worship, when they had to make journeys, when they were trying to figure out, uh, Lord, these, these situations happening in my life and I don't have the words to say. How many ever had situations that you didn't have the words to say? You, you were speechless. You were trying to figure out, how can I put these words together? And so one of the great things about these books of the biblical text is sometimes these words are put together on our behalf so we don't have to start from scratch. Uh, in our Christian tradition, uh, there is a book that uh, the Anglican and the Catholic Church has used called the Book of Common Prayer. And that is a text that is often used to pray prayers that have been prayed for thousands of years. Well, when we look at the book of Psalms, I want you to know that these prayers have been prayed for literally six, 6,000 years. Uh, and, and that helps you and I to appreciate that when in doubt, go to the Psalms. When you don't know what to say, go to the Psalms. When you feel like you're looking for uh, a, a way to talk to God and you're worried about God, I don't want to be disrespectful, go to the Psalms. Because, you know, in the book of Psalms, it's a bunch of real talk in the Psalms. The Psalms is a real talk kind of book. The Psalms ain't, you know, going to, like, blow smoke up nothing. But the Psalms is like, God, I'm in distress. I need your help. Uh, they have Psalms called imprecatory Psalms. And the, these kind of Psalms, you pray them when you're, you know, praying for your enemies to be destroyed. <laughs> Maybe you should stay away from some of them songs, amen. But I'm just telling you, if you need some words to say, amen. Because, you know, Jesus tells us to, to, to forgive our enemies and to love them. And how many know sometimes those words escape you? So when in doubt, I say, find them a precatory songs. Say, like, I'm just giving back to you what you gave to me. Amen. So Psalms chapter 84, uh, it's 12 uh, verses. Uh, I'm going to, you know, just read them all in our hearing because I think it is a wonderful, beautiful passage of Scripture this uh, book was, uh, or this particular chapter, uh, was written by the Korhites, who were some of the, the uh, Levitical servants in the temple. And that just meant that they were kind of like our worship leaders, our musicians, people who are skilled in creating an environment and a context for worship and praise to God. And so they wrote this, this psalm, and this psalm uh, was used as they made trips to Zion, to the temple of God. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my king and my God. Isn't the richness of this language, just it just paints wonderful pictures, right? Verse number four, happy, everybody say happy, happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a well. The early rain also covers it with pools, and they go from strength to strength, and the God of gods will be seen in Zion. Verse number eight, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. Verse number 10, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. And I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than live in the tents of 
wickedness. For the Lord, God, is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor and no good thing. Somebody say no good thing. No good thing thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Amen. So we are, amen, going to let this be our anniversary message, amen, uh, for our time of preaching and teaching. And uh, simply, I I think I'm just going to entitle this message, amen, stay in the courts. Stay in the courts. Let's pray, God. We want to say thank you, Lord. That's the word of God for us, the people of God. I want to say, Lord God, that you will hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy and let it rest on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Actually, I think I'm going to title this sermon, Make It A Well. I think I like that better. Tell your neighbor, make it a well. Amen. Make it a well. Yeah, I think I like that. Amen. Now, again, as I've already stated, the book of Psalms is often uh, considered a, a collection of prayers, a collection of songs that the children of Israel always tapped into as they were trying to navigate the vicissitudes, ups and downs, the idiosyncrasies, the challenges, the highs, the lows, all of these different moments in their life they found their life to really be one of a journey. A journey that was always in search of language, in search of meaning, in search of purpose. And one of our greatest tasks as followers of Jesus is to always remember that meaning making, the making of meaning for that which you go through will be a key for how you cultivate hope how you maintain perspective. Because there will be moments in your life will, where experiences can have a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? They can overdefine your life if you allow them to. You can have moments where uh, you can be too high on the hall. Right? You ever met somebody who reads their own press clippings? <laughs> And, you know, you forget that, you know, you good, but you ain't that good. Amen. And even if you are good, uh, you know, at whatever you do, whatever your superpower is, even if that's true, your superpower is temporary. Because time always catches up with even our best offerings. Sometimes you can allow even your most lowest moments to define or overdefine your life. And you'll find yourself locked into a space that was and is temporary. And so the highs of your life and the lows of your life at every point in between, if we are not careful, it can become a place that causes us to lose hope, lose perspective, and at the core forget that they all have meaning. We talked a little bit about this last week in our uh, message about don't stop praying. What is it, God, that you are seeking to teach and show me as I seek your face, as I wrestle with what I'm dealing with in this moment, in this season, as I go through my life journey, what would you have me to learn? As I pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does it mean for your will to be done in my life on earth, in my current moment as it is in heaven, your eternal space where all things are resolved? I want you to think about that, that in God's existence, in God's place, if you will, everything that concerns you is resolved. Everything. Everything that you feel is a loose end, you are praying and engaging, and dare I say, uh, inhabiting space with a God who knows the resolution, even while you're living in the in-between space. Oh, somebody say, that's a mighty God. 
Amen. That's why you and I ought to keep trying to be in the place where God is. Because if you're hanging out with God and you're in an unresolved in-between place, you are literally connected to the end from the beginning. That's why one of the texts says that, you know, he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning. And that's not just a nice little, you know, you are alpha. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And omega. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. No, that, that, is, that is God giving you an expectation that while you go through your trial, not only am I with you, but I'm also waiting for you at the end. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever, you know, uh, you know, ha have 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 uh, had uh, 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 children doing races and stuff. And and and, you know, sometimes we do this in, in, in weddings when you have a kid who's like, you know, supposed to be uh, bringing the 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 the, the they, what are flower girls and, and, and ring bears. And they so shy and, and they, they, they get out there and they see everybody looking at them. And what do they do? They they kind of wilt and they kind of turn. And they kind of go back and like, no, you got to keep going. And it's like, I'm not walking down that thing by myself. And it's like, no, the show can't go on. And so what, what do you do? Sometimes the mother or the father or the parent runs to the end of the road. And they're like, come on, come on, come on, come on. And then that baby will look up and be like, okay, I see a light I recognize at the end of this tunnel. I want you to know, child of God, whenever you start to feel nervous, whenever you're on your journey and you don't know what's at the end of that road, the scripture says that there is a presence, a place, a space, a God who is waiting for you, beckoning you to come. Amen. God knows how to help us get from point A to point B. And over the last 17 years, I want to submit to you that at our church, we've had to go through some valleys. We've had to go through some challenges. And it hasn't been necessarily because we're a drama-filled church. It's just that life happens over time. And, you know, we're still going through a troubling season right now, amen, with all of the issues related to COVID-19 and monkeypox and injustice and violence and, 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 and insurrections and, and health concerns and family transitions. Some of us started out a college student. Now you, you in the workplace, praise God. Some of us, you know, uh, 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 was written. Now you a homeowner, praise God. Some, some of you, you know, you, you've done retired. Where you were yesterday is not necessarily where you are today. And this is part and parcel of why I love the book of songs, because there are moments in our life with God where our theology will be in search of experience, which just means that what you know about God is true, but your life has not yet caught up to that revelation. I've learned and I was told by my mom and them that God will make a way out of no way. But I've not yet experienced God making a way out of no way. So I have theology in search of experience. I was told that God will provide for my needs. And, and, you know, I haven't had a need yet for God to provide. So, you know, my theology is still in search of experience. You know, sometimes our faith is mediated through the eyes of our parents, of our grandparents. You know, anybody ever, you know, you know, listen or remember uh, what your grandparents used to say about God? And you was like, wow, that must have been some kind of God. I haven't needed to have that experience yet. But now you're starting to live a little bit. And, you know, the things your grandparents or your mom and them say, now you saying it about God. You know, you used to laugh at your parents. Oh, they say, go, baby, God's a good guy. You be, hee, 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 that's so funny. And now you get in a situation and you be like, man, God is a good God. <laughs> you ought to give your neighbor elbow bump and tell him God is a good God. I mean, time is teaching me that God is a good God. It is theology in search of experience. But then what the Psalms teaches us is that there will also be moments where your experience will be in search of theology. Well, you will go through things and you will have to figure out, God, my experience has not yet uh, uh, caught up to what I believe. 
There'll be moments where your life, your journey, the questions you have, are you're looking for what does God have to say about my life, my journey, my challenges. And I want to submit to you that whether your life is dealing with theology in search of experience, or you are in a moment where you are having experiences and you need theology to help them make sense, God is present in both places. Sometimes, you know, we think that the doctrinal positions of our church are the totality of what builds our faith. We need good foundational theological truths like, you know, God is, is, is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That, that the Holy Spirit is there to empower you and fill you with power so you can defeat the devil. We need those things. Baptism, that is a wonderful, wonderful theological foundation that Jesus was born of a woman and he was indeed, you know, a uh, 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 racially profiled and, and executed by the state and he rose again. Those are good theological beliefs and we need that. But how many know sometimes you'll have an experience and you're trying to figure out, God, what does my experience have to do with you being Father, Son, Holy Spirit? I mean, you know, I, I love that foundational, you know, that foundational revelation, but God, right now, my experience in this sickness my experience with my children, my experience in this unjust world, I need some theology. I need some sense, some God sense to help this make sense. And it is in those moments that the Psalms teach us that God knows how to meet you while you are going through experiences in search of theology. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, meet me, God, in my experience in search of theology. Why? Because the Holy Spirit works at the intersection of your experiences in search of theology. The Holy Ghost is there to help you make sense of the nonsensical. The Holy Ghost is there to help open your eyes when you can't see that well. The Holy Ghost is there to give you language when you can't find the words to say. The Holy Ghost is there to help you make sense of your experiences. And that's why this text, as they are going to the temple, they're told you ought to go to the place of Zion. Zion is, you know, in the text, it is the temple. It is not, you know, some of us think that Zion is, you know, from the matrix. <laughs> How many know that, uh, you know, Zion did not come out of the mind of the Wachowski brothers, praise God. That Zion is a symbolic, if not concrete, synonym and place that is about the temple. And what the children of Israel always understood is that when in doubt, I need to make my journey to the temple. That they built into the life of their, their year and their experience that we have to make annual trips to the temple. Why? Because we know this is where God is. I want you to know, child of God, that no matter what season of life you're in, always make trips to where God is. Sometimes you may think God is not where you're at. That's not necessarily true. God is with you always. But how many know sometimes you need to put a little effort into making some trips where you know God will be? There are some places where God's concentration of power can be felt just by you walking into that space. Amen, amen, amen. And, and, and sometimes, you know, those places are curated to be so. You know, God is, you know, you can see God in nature. You can see God almost anywhere. But how many of you know sometimes it's important for you just to be able to say, you know what? God, I, I, it's hard for me to find you in the midst of all my challenges, so that's why I'm going to go to the prayer meeting. That's why I'm going I'm to curate some spaces where I know you are there. Not I'm hoping you show up, but God, I know you're there. And the children of Israel made these annual trips to the place of Zion. Now, what's so interesting about this trip that they had to make is that their trip to Zion was always literally uh, accompanied by a journey of trial. Now, what do you think about this? You have your scheduled trips. You know, how many of you make vacation schedules like, you know, once or twice a year, every couple of years? You're like, I, I got the schedule into my life of vacation. 
because I work too much or I don't make enough money or, you know, I got too many responsibilities. And so I can't just like some, some folks just get up. Like my parents, they do this now. They're in the season of their life. Oh, we just going to go to Canada. Really? God bless you. Well, you tell the, you tell the Canadians we said hello. Amen. Some, some, some folks, you just free. I'm just going to, you know, free as a bird. I'm going to go. Some of us, we got to like plan it out six months, a year, two years at a time. Amen. Get our coins together. Get the babysitters. All y'all got dogs. Now get the dog sitters. You know, you got to do all these things to get ready for a trip. So imagine you're getting ready for a trip, but your trip, you know, is going to be littered with obstacles. If you kind of like me, it's like, you know, uh, I think I'm going to stay home because, you know, I don't want to go on vacation. They need to come back and get a vacation from the vacation I just was on. Amen. But, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And so they know that I, we as a people need to always go to the temple. Why? Because we know God is there. But at the temple, we also know that we can recapture some of our own cultural significance and direction and meaning. So as they make their journey, listen, the scripture says that they have to travel through the valley of Baca. Now, Baca means the valley of weeping. It is a valley of tears. It is a place of sorrow and difficulty. And so on their way to Zion, no matter what direction they took, they always had to go through the valley of Baca. That, you know, all these many years, you think they figure out a way to skip the valley. <laughs> Amen. How many spend our, our life, season of our life, trying to skip valleys? We sit around, okay, I, nah, I went that way. All right, so I'm not going down that way again. But I'm going to go this way, and you run into the valley. Man, that valley seemed to be everywhere. I'm just, so, 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 so what you learn to realize is that the valley is just a part of your journey. But you don't have to set up shop in the valley. And that's the first thing I want you to realize, that even though we have to go through the valley, you must assume that every valley that comes your way, you will pass through it. Somebody holler, it will pass. The first step to you making your situations a well is to remember that it will pass. Past. Listen, theology in search of experience, this is a great theological foundational point for you to build your life on that no matter what situation I'm going through, I have a theological faith foundational a belief that this will pass. Uh, my trouble won't last our way. You know, I, some of y'all may, may know Timothy Rice song where he says, I'm so glad. Troubles don't last our ways, right? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Somebody holler, it will pass. Don't you know what kind of confidence you and I could live our lives with every day if we knew this is going to pass? That I wake up every morning and I'm in trouble, but I'm looking around and say, could it be today? Could it be today that this is the last day of the worst day of my life? Woo. Oh, give your neighbor an elbow bump and tell him this will pass. Your tears will pass. Your depression will pass. Your, your brokenness will pass. Everything that is not going well, it will pass. Why? Because you're going through the valley of Baca. Uh, that's what the scripture says. It don't say you hanging out in the Valley of Baca. You buying property in the Valley of Baca. You getting a condo and a house. Amen. You got a vacation house in the Valley of Baca. No, you're meant to go through it. So you ought to tell yourself, oh, the devil's telling me I'm going to be here always. No, the devil don't know what the devil's talking about. The devil's a deceiver. He's a liar. Why would I listen to a liar when God has already told me what I ought to believe? <laughs> Uh, that this too will pass. And then what I like too about, uh, you know, this, this passing moment, I think I was sharing with a few folks yesterday that when I went to Egypt, you know, uh, for my, my, my birthday trip last year, you know, I, I, I landed around 7 p.m. After a 13, 14, 15, it was a long flight. Way too long. My neck and my back and my back and my neck, everything was hurting. But in my mind, I was trying to get to Mount Sinai because I wanted to go travel up the mountain. I wanted to hang out where Moses was and where Jesus was. I said, if I could just step my feet on the holy ground, like that place I was talking about where you know God is there, 
You ain't got to wonder. You know Mount Sinai got to be a holy place. If Jesus and Moses and Elijah, all them folk was there, that means the dirt itself must have just been some holy dirt. I'm talking about some sanctified dirt. I'm talking about some dirt. Amen. They're just the divinity of God just all in the dirt. I almost got on the ground, start rolling around. <laughs> I, I didn't need to, though, because every step I took, the dirt just stopped up in the air. I mean, I was choking, praise God. I, I, I showed up there dark, and I came, came back darker. Amen. It was dirt everywhere, right? But what's the point? We had to get to Mount Sinai, from Jerusalem where I landed to, uh, I'm sorry, from Cairo where I landed to get to Mount Sinai was a four and a half hour drive. But listen to this, because we landed so late, there is a journey you have to take from the airport all the way to Mount Sinai. And if you don't get there by a certain time, they literally close the roads. Because from where we're driving in Cairo over into to, 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 to Mount Sinai, you, it is an, un, for all intents and purposes, I'm going to call it an unincorporated part of Asia. And on this road, oh, this is so deep, this is good stuff, praise God, is preaching to me right now. On this road, in order for you to get to Mount Sinai, you had to go through this unincorporated road that had in its, in its, in its unseen places pirates, thieves, and robbers bandits and so if you didn't get through the road by a certain time they literally shut the road down and they had to keep then all of the cars that wanted to make this trip overnight you had to move together accompanied by the army the Egyptian army and they would have folks on motorcycles and in Humvees and they literally have a caravan of about 25 to 30 buses and cars. And so my, my personal, uh, 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 what would he call that, host person, uh, he driving me around, we get in the line. And so we're sitting there and we can only move a few hours at a time. What took four and a half hours or what was a four and a half hour drive took 12 hours. So from 7 o'clock, walking off the plane, I'm in a little, and I'm, now mind you, I wasn't in no limousine where I could stretch out. I'm in a little old Toyota Corolla car. And we making our way. But I heard the Lord speak to me, amen, uh, as I was making our way through the Valley of Baca. What did it say? You need to stay in community. Why? Because it's in community that you're safe. When you're going through the valley of Baca, if you run out there by yourself, how I many know there's a bandit out there waiting on you? Even while you're trying to get to Zion, if you go by yourself, you may not make it through the valley. Why? Because there are bandits and robbers and mean uh, intentions waiting for you on the road. And so you got to stay together. And in the group, you got folk that will look out for you. In the group, you got folks that will tell you, stay in the courts. Stay in the house. Stay in relationship. Whatever you do while we're going through COVID, while you're going through your trial, don't get isolated. Don't throw in the towel and say, oh, I'm giving up on community. No, stay in community, even if it means you may have to journey a little while longer. Some of us feel like, well, if I go by myself, I'll get there faster. If you go by yourself, you may not get there at all. <laughs> Give your neighbor elbow bump and say, I got to stay together, amen. Because I, you know, a, 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 a delayed arrival is better than no arrival at all. Do I have a witness here today that knows that I need to stay in community? Why? Because it's in the community that I can make it through the valley of Baca. And while I'm in the valley, guess what? They had pit stops. Because, you know, 14 hour trip. You know, you got to stop and stretch your legs, get some water. And guess what? Along the way, somebody had created a well. Somebody had created a, a place of reprieve. What does this mean? It means that sometimes you are going to need to tap into your own superpower to make a well so the people that are coming behind you won't have to figure out where it is moments and times for them to take a little bit of a rest, take a little bit of a reprieve. How many of you know all of us got a superpower that God has given you to make your dry places a well? 
You may have a shovel, uh, make it a well. You may have a jackhammer, make it a well. You may have to use a little spoon, make it a little well, praise God. But whatever you have, child of God, make your season of life a well. Why? Because when you start to dig up some ground, and when you start to make some space for the presence of God to dwell, that the well you create creates an opportunity for God to shower down the rain. And I want you to know that the scripture says that they make it a well. Why? So the early rain and the dew and the moisture of God can fall and it can be captured in the well you create. I hear God speaking to some of us today and I hear God saying that you may not always be able to control the journey you're on. You may not always be able to, 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 to handle or to determine what enemies are coming your way. But what I've given you, child of God, along these many years, I've given you something to make a well. Something to dig up some ground. Something to create a space. So when God begins to shower a blessing or two, you won't have to worry, can I hold the blessing that's coming you won't have to worry God can I handle what you're sending my way but every lesson you bring me I'm making a well so I can hold it every belief I'm creating I'm making a well so it can exist every lesson I'm learning I'm making a well so it can be a place of inhabitation and I I got a feeling uh, that the more wells I dig, uh, the more experiences I have, uh, the more faith comes my way. Uh, I may not have a lot of wells today, uh, but the longer I walk with the God of all creation, uh, the longer I take one step after another, uh, the God I serve uh, will help me make a well. Uh, and when I make a well, uh, I see the rain coming. Uh, Rain that can fill the well. Rain that can fill the ditch. Rain that can fill the hole. And I'm so glad that when I need a good drink from the well of my salvation, I don't have to manufacture anything. I can go back to the well I dug. And out of the well of salvation, I can pull joy in the midst of my sorrow. I can pull peace uh, in the midst of my disturbance. Uh, I can pull strength uh, when I am weak. Uh, make it a well uh, wherever you are at. Uh, make it a well uh, whatever season you're in. Uh, make it a well. Uh, use your power. Uh, use your anointing. Uh, use your gifts uh, and say, God, I will uh, make this a well. Uh, God, I will. Uh, healed in this season. God, I will defeat the devil in my life. God, I will make it a well. Do I have somebody that can say, I will make a well. I will dig a ditch. I will make a way for God to fill me up till I overflow. I want to run over. I want to be filled. I want to be saved. I want to be delivered. Make it a well. Make it a well. Make it a well. Shout hallelujah. Son. And it is in the well that you'll find a history of God's activity. When we do our justice work, I love our work to be intergenerational. Why? Because we ought to be drinking from the wells of the elders. Hello, somebody. We're not just starting out fighting this fight today. Whatever vocation you're in, whatever season you're in, don't talk to people who is your age. I sometimes think 
that when your best counsel is people your age, you are actually making a commentary on how little you know. Amen. I mean, there are some folk who, you know, are wise beyond their years. But why would you only get counsel from people who are wise beyond your years? Well, you can get counsel from people who have lived beyond your years. Who've dug a few wells in their life. Who've seen some of this before. Now, that don't mean that what they did you have to do. But it does mean that there is safety. There is value. There is life in the wisdom of our elders, those who've dug some of these ditches. It's our elders sometimes that'll tell you, you know, just keep living. God's going to bring you out. It's some of our elders, you know, who they can get a prayer through a little bit. Not better, they just, you know, they're going to wait longer than you and I wait. And it don't matter what age you are. It really is about God. Can I stay in the courts where everything I need is there? Stand with me, everyone, as we prepare to pray. Because I want you to be clear about you having an assumption that whatever season you're in, this will pass. And it's not... It's not just about bad seasons. Sometimes you're going to have some extreme highs. But even your highs will pass. Amen. So it is about you and I being clear about the seasons of life. And not being surprised. I mean, it don't mean you got to like it. You know, I know I'm supposed to eat vegetables. That don't mean I got to like it. (laughs) No, I'm supposed to work out. don't mean I got to like it. But it's true anyhow. I know I got to study. I know I got to say I'm sorry. I know I got to figure out how to make this right. It don't mean I have to like it. But those highs should give you the well, right, where you can tap into it, get what you need. So when you're in a season that you don't like, you're still drawing from the well of salvation. Close your eyes, lift those hands to God and say, God, help me to make this a well. Help me to make this a well, oh God. Help me to make this a well where the rain that you send can fill it. Fill it with the power of your spirit. God, I pray right now, Lord, as we're going through this season, that you will keep sending down an outpour of your spirit. The blessings, oh God, the strength, oh God, the fire, the purpose, the meaning, the lessons, the hope, the joy. Keep sending it down, oh God. Some of us need healing in this place. I pray that healing will flow, Lord God. Some of us need strength. Some of us need vision. Some of us need help. God, I pray that it will flow. I pray that it will flow in a way, God, that reminds us that you are the source you are the sustaining power that moves us from point a to b and god in those moments where we're afraid to make the journey god may we look up and see you at the end of the journey beckoning us to come to zion to the place where you are keep moving us from glory to glory from strength to strength and we'll say thank you lord we'll say thank you lord We'll give your name the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, hug somebody. Give them a high five. Tell them, make it a well. Make it a well. Make it a well. See.